Hello guys, I hope you can hear me well. This is the Connect to Nature podcast. Welcome to the show. You know what? One of the biggest challenges recording this session is actually getting a quiet place at home because I live right next to the road. Can you imagine the noise? Also, I have my two brothers working from home too, so I can only dream of having a peace and quiet time in here. But hey, we do what we can, right? Anyway, I believe you're going to have a good session today nonetheless. So without further ado, let's get on to the show. Yeah, <laughs> are you guys enjoying the music? You know, it feels like a party is about to go down in here. For a moment, it doesn't feel like a podcast on nature, huh? <laughs> nah, I just think it would be really cool to add some music, have some fun, and get that energy going, you know? It's rock and roll, what's not to love? For today, guys, we are going to be sharing some exciting stories and also be discussing some great topics as well. I have a feeling it's going to be a good one, guys, so stick around until the end. Anyway, let me introduce myself. My name is Hey Carl, and I'm from WWF Singapore, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Thank you for tuning in to this podcast. For this session, we have collaborated with the National Heritage Board as part of the Singapore Heritage Festival. The idea is simple, to come together to celebrate the rich and diverse multicultural heritage that defines our identity as a nation. When we heard of the term heritage, right, we think about traditional kampung games such as Five Stones, Spinning Top, Chongka, and many more. Maybe for some of us, we think of historical sites like the Peranakan Museum, Kampung Glam, Fort Canning Park, you name it. These things and places do capture the essence of our heritage. And heritage is important in a society as it plays a vital role in instilling a sense of place and belonging in us. But today, we're going to look at heritage from a different lens. We will be discussing how nature is also a part of our heritage that is worth preserving and how we can connect back to nature. Together to break down the topic with us today is a dear colleague of mine who happens to be one of the most joyful personalities I have ever met, who also happens to be an avid lover of nature. June. Welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. June, it's really nice to hear from you again after working separately for quite some time. How have you been coping working from home? Well, I got to admit, it's not, I'm not, I've not been doing that great. Reason being, <laughs> I find myself having like twice the work to do right now. So I do my normal work work and then I have a ton <laughs> of housework to do. What about you? Yeah. Um, for me, right, it was difficult at first. You know, working within the four walls is not something I'm used to. Also, I'm living with my two brothers, so just avoiding from getting to each other's nerves yes. was really a challenge in itself, let alone sharing the space peacefully. I mean, it's been it's been two months now or more than that. And what can I say? We are more loving and empathetic <laughs> than before. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we have quite a number of exciting things to talk about today, guys. So do stay with us until the end of the podcast. We will do our best to only bring you great content throughout the show. So June, Elena was just sharing with our friends who are listening about the many traditional kampong games we played while growing up and even old places we have fond memories of. Do you happen to have one of those moments, right? Where you look at something and it triggered a distant memory of your past? Oh yes, I certainly do. So, uh, so let me just tell you, right? Like recently to stay productive, I started cleaning my house and that is something that I've never done before, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I started cleaning my house voluntarily and I chanced upon some of the uh, old games that I used to play with my family and my friends and my neighbours. So back in, back when I was still in primary school, we, I really used to love going out with my neighbours and my family especially to a nearby open field below uh-huh. my block. And play games like Chapte. So I wasn't really very fantastic at it, to be very, to be very honest with you, because I have like zero eyelid coordination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, June. Of course, I know about it. I've played uh, some sports with you before, so 
I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, please don't expose me here. <laughs> but yeah, thinking back, right? Although although I couldn't really win a game, it was still pretty fun, and it was a very it was just a very nice, simple, and contented time, you know, for me. So what about you? Something yes, I did play a lot of it when I was in primary school. But for me, it's more of a place, um, as far as I can remember, you know, any recollection of a good memory. is When I was a kid, my parents used to bring me to Sambong Park. There was this playground with a zip line where, according to her, I could never get enough of. I would cry if we had to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, about a year ago, uh, I revisited the park after, you know, over 20 over years. Unfortunately, the playground is not there anymore. I mean, the old playground is not there because it has been revamped and it looked nothing like the like the old one. Nonetheless, it's still an impressive reconstruction. They actually designed it to look like a battleship, which kind of reflects the shipbuilding heritage of Sembawang. Do you know that Sembawang was once Singapore's naval base? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. It was built by the British government in the 1920s. It was designed to protect Singapore, get this, from external threats during World War II. And we are talking about threats coming from the sea. If you want to know more about it, um, there is this Yishun Sembong Heritage Trail that you can check out. Maybe to our friends living in the northern side of Singapore, it could be something that you might be interested in. So if you are, just go over to www.nhb.gov.sg to find out more about it. Back to the story, right, Jun? I want to quickly share something interesting with you here. Uh, I read one of these, uh, one of the library books called uh, Of Hearts and Mind, The Story of Sembong Shipyard by Melanie Chu. Apparently, during the construction of the naval base, the British faced two sets of problems. First, they had some issues removing this one particular tree. Like it was believed by the locals at that time that there were spirits residing in this tree. So there was a need for a special ceremony to be performed before they could actually remove it. Despite that, right, the British officers refused to accede to the superstition and went ahead with the construction. And guess what? Something happened. And if you want to know what happened, you got to stay tuned until the end of the podcast. Oh my gosh, yeah. how could you do and, that? Um, <laughs> this story is a good example of our cultural heritage too. The belief in sacred trees still exists today. The second problem they faced, which is something that we are going to be talking about today, was actually because of a high rainfall and the presence of wild animals like crocodiles and crabs at the construction site. As it turns out, the land where the construction was set was a mangrove swamp, one of the many places of nature with rich biodiversity. And as we know today, our mangroves, rather our nature, is facing the pressures from rapid urbanization. That essentially means our trees are being replaced by buildings and houses. Do you know, today in Singapore, we are left with less than 5% of our original mangroves since the 19th, sorry, 1800s. Mangroves are important to wildlife because they are rich ecological habitats for many animals. Not only that, mangroves are also important to us because they act as one of our natural carbon sinks. Like it can store carbon four times more than our rainforest. And the magic actually comes from the soil beneath the mangrove trees. That begs the question, right, June? We are living in such a beautiful country today. Do you think it is possible to build what Singapore is today, but not at the expense of our natural heritage, you know, without taking away nature? Hmm, so that's a very good question. I think we are truly grateful for what we have become as a nation and as a country. Despite our limited resources here, we have achieved so much and that goes to show the hard work our forefathers and our generation have put in to make Singapore what it is today. So going back to your question here, Hegel, what is more pressing now is that we understand the importance of nature better than ever and that we can take action to protect it. In fact, do you know this? We are the very first generation that has a clear picture of the value of nature and could be the last generation that can take action to reverse this trend. Nature brings so many benefits like the food we eat, the water we drink and the clean air that we breathe. Not only that, nature is also a key ally against climate change. So if we lose nature, we tend to lose all of that. 
So I believe that changes are necessary to adapt to global advances. We cannot cling to our past yet hope for a different future. That is just not possible. And I feel, you know, as we develop and as we move forward, just as much as we have strived to preserve some of our cultural and national heritage, we should do just as much, if not more, for our natural heritage. And that means our trees, our wildlife, our precious ecosystems. As we are talking about protecting our wildlife here, sightings of them have become more and more common today in our urban jungle. So for example, otters are increasingly spotted closer to our homes. And the most recent one is the 3 meters long uh, king cobra that was spotted just outside Marsling oh, yeah, MRT. Yeah, 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 it was just a week ago, isn't it right, June? I think it really came as a shock to me. It would be great to see a king cobra. <laughs> I think... I think it's quite fortunate that um, nobody was hurt. So Acres handled the situation very well. They kept both people and the wildlife safe and unhurt. And, you know, these recurring sightings here, uh, it, it just goes to show that nature is closer to us than we think. Yeah, I totally agree with you there, June. Uh, to bring back to what we are going through right now, one of the main reasons for this global health pandemic is, is our increased exposure to wildlife. In other words, we are getting closer to them. This has made us realize that nature and our health are closely linked. If I can share with our friends while listening to is, there was this published report that I, that I read recently on the connection between coronavirus and wildlife. Like uh, coronavirus, as we know, is a type of zoonotic virus that has the potential of human-to-human -human spread. Therefore, it holds the potential to become a pandemic like what we have today. To briefly sum up what the report says, we are more vulnerable to zoonotic diseases when humans and wildlife are exposed to each other in close proximity. And there are two direct drivers for this. The first is deforestation, and that is mainly driven by intensive agriculture. And secondly, the exploitation of wildlife. As we clear forests and convert land for our own use, right, we have a higher chance of crossing paths with the wildlife as we force them to live in smaller habitats. This also opens to easier poaching and exploitation of wildlife, which makes us more vulnerable to the zoonotic diseases. And at this point, we all know nature is essential to our survival. It provides us with food, air, water. Like you mentioned earlier on, these are the foundations of a thriving society. So recovering and rebuilding from impacts of COVID-19, I believe now we have a chance to rebalance our relationship with nature. We can start with appreciating the urban wildlife the plants, the ecosystems right here in Singapore. Just like the wildlife encounters we shared earlier, we can coexist with them and let them live. After all, we share the same space and only by living in harmony can we ensure a better future for nature and ourselves. But I believe it makes it a lot easier for us to appreciate nature when we actually understand its importance. Jun, you spend a lot of time in nature, right? Like, uh, I remember you told me that you enjoy exploring different parks and nature reserves here in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You really do have a very good memory <laughs> there, yeah? <laughs> so I do, I do go out, um, I do go out at least, you know, twice a month during the weekends, um, together with my friends and my families to visit the different parks and nature reserves in Singapore. It's re really very twice fun. Twice a month? Yeah, twice a month. Can you believe it? And wow. right now, I'm just I'm feeling a little bit stifled because I, I have stopped this currently during the circuit breaker period. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, what do you enjoy most about being in nature? Well, in general, right, I just I just find being surrounded by nature very calming and very relaxing. I love nature photography as well. So I, I'm not a professional mm. photographer. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> but I do, <laughs> hey, now, I don't want to believe that I'm actually getting better at it. So with nature photography, you have to be very patient because you have to wait for the right moment. And when that moment comes, you have to capture it quickly before the moment passes. So I cannot tell you, right? The amount of times hmm. I've missed great opportunities. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You must have you must be really patient. Exactly. Wait, how do you think I cultivated my patience? You know, it's from <laughs> this. <laughs> so earlier, you know, you mentioned that nature and our health are closely linked. And I want to take this opportunity to highlight that, you know, being in nature has a significant impact on our health hmm. and on our mental health and our well-being. Other than singing karaoke, June. 
<laughs> Please, that's a different story altogether. So for our listeners here, this is yeah. just an inside joke, and we're going to move from move on from this. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but re- I I do just want to put it out there that this is also one of the main reasons why I choose to spend time forest bathing. It makes me feel mm-hmm. so tranquil. It makes me feel very zen. Wait, forest bathing is that a term? Yeah, it is. Come on, you need to keep up with the times here, Hika. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I, I'm guessing from your response here, you don't really know what forest bathing is. Let me drop you some knowledge. Yes. So <laughs> please enlighten us. <laughs> it means taking in or immersing yourself in the forest atmosphere, not actually taking a bath. <laughs> <laughs> so it's from a, it's from a Japanese term. It's called shirin yoku. Shirin yoku. That's right. Oh my gosh, your pro- your pronunciation <laughs> okay, is. Nice. is Improving so much. So, thank you. <laughs> Shirin Yoko. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, by practicing mindfulness in nature, right, it benefits us in so many ways. It reduces our stress hormones, it reduces anxiety, and it also reduces aggression as well. At the end of a mm. very stressful day, it really does help to soothe your nerves. Mm. Shirin Yoko. Uh, did I say it right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I must say yes. <laughs> You know, when I say it, it sounded like a type of fish. <laughs> you know, since you mentioned reducing stress hormones, right? Before I know about all these benefits, I used to have this habit of listening to sounds of nature on my headphones whenever I feel stressed out from, you know, work or school. Uh, like the sounds of bird chirping, the ruffling of the leaves. I've tried listening to songs with lyrics, but they didn't quite have the same calming effect. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I felt more distracted. <laughs> I don't know if you can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Come on. That's why I love being in nature. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, right, there was a study in 2015 by a doctor in Cambridge. Mm-hmm. And, it, and the study shows that being in nature actually affects our brain activity and emotions. It compared um, the brain activities of two groups of healthy people. So mm-hmm. there was one group and the, um, one group that went on to walk in nature and, and the other group went on in an urban setting. And after 90 minutes, they compared the results of the brain activities of both groups and they found that the group who spends more time in nature has a lower tendency to develop negative thoughts and emotions. Isn't that amazing? That's cool. Exactly. So, you know, going back to what I like to do, and this is something that you can do as well. And even our friends who are listening here, I can, um, I like to go to the park and, you know, find a quiet place, close my eyes and just mm. relax. At this point, my other senses are slightly heightened and I pay attention to the smell of nature. <laughs> I don't know how to describe this, but uh, it smells earthly, you know, like oh. like smelling the warmth on the ground on a rainy day. I think, hey, I told you, I don't know how to describe I this. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> 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 so you know while, while I'm doing this in itself right I'm also starting to sense the light breeze on my skin and also try to listen for the distant sounds of birds chirping and sometimes even counting how many different sounds I can identify oh oh okay no, so before I forget this you know try and spot the straw headed boo boo aka the singing bird they are very oh, okay. vocal at dawn and before dusk wait 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 let me search for the sound straw headed boo boo yes uh? Let me search for the sounds so our listeners know what they should look out for. Sure, go ahead. So for our listeners here, a uh, straw-headed boo is a type of songbird. And songbirds are known for their melodious calls. Ah, okay. Okay, Jen, I got it. Go for it. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm about to play you the sound of the straw-headed boo which is known for their melodious calls. So pay attention to this one. I told you. Nice. You know, Jun, it reminded me of the Asian corel bird. You know, the bird, the noisy bird that wakes people up 5 a.m. in the morning that goes, ooh. <laughs> it is beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Definitely is. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm afraid I do have some bad news here to share though, you know. Unfortunately, right, because of their melodious singing, they are poached to extinction everywhere. Oh, no, worry not, because the good news is that they can still be heard in our nature reserves. In fact, the species is still thriving here in Singapore. Oh, okay. I think that's good news, right? Um, mm. I mean, I'll be sure to look out for it the next time I'm in a nature park. You know, uh, now that I know how it sounds like, I think I'm 
I think I'm quite positive that I can identify the sound of the bird. Anyway, June, uh, I guess for someone like myself, who is you know rather short tempered, bathing in nature sounds like a great remedy to stay calm. How about <laughs> exercising in nature? Is it significantly more beneficial running in a nature park versus running at the stadium? <laughs> Well, we all have our own preferences, but saying that, right, I do encourage you to exercise in nature. It's like killing two birds with one stone. You get both physical and mental well-being. So, for example, other than running, if you love doing yoga, and, and yoga is a great way, right, to actually cultivate your patience as well. So maybe you can, like, if you love doing yoga, maybe you can head out to the park instead of doing it from your home. When people are in nature, they inhale the aroma from the plants. This can actually increase their immune system. And that's why since 2018, doctors in Scotland are authorised to prescribe nature to help treat a variety of medical conditions. Bring this um, topic closer to home. Do you know that there are hospitals here in Singapore that integrate nature into the design of their wards? What Jurong Community Hospital and Ng Teng Fong Community Hospital did for their wards is instead of placing the patient facing the other patient in the next bed as, uh, as usual design, they, they can choose to sleep facing the window in, where they can have the view of the greenery and enjoy a flow of the natural light. It, br- it really just brightens up the entire experience as well for the patients and also for the visitors too. So this means, right, the patients can enjoy the benefits of the natural aroma from the plants, which can potentially increase their immune system and speed up the recovery process. Interesting. I love, uh, you know, stories of how we integrate nature into our designs because it highlights another important value of nature and that is it allows us to draw inspiration from it as well, from the shapes, colors, and even to the way they function. Nature truly is our best teacher. This actually reminds me of the Japanese Shinkansen bullet train. I don't know if I pronounce it right. You learn Japanese, right, Jun? Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. It's pronounced Shinkansen. Shinkansen. <laughs> Shinkansen. That's right. Shinkansen. <laughs> <laughs> Must have that tone, that power there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so as we know, the Shinkansen bullet train operates at high speed. And because of that, it produces really loud noise as it travels. And we are talking about noise that is louder than when you are at a rock concert. So it becomes a problem for people living near the tracks. To combat that, the engineers integrated a new design to the nose of the train to look like the shape of a bird's beak. And this design is actually inspired by the kingfisher. It's a majestic bird, it's a colourful bird, and there are many species of the kingfisher. Perhaps our listeners have heard of this before. And yeah, the good news is you can spot them in Singapore, given that we still have very good, healthy nature around. Oh, really? That's so cool. Where exactly? Oh, they are more commonly found at wetlands and beach parks, where there are large bodies of water. Uh, I saw them a couple of months back when I was uh, just taking a morning walk at Pasir Ris Park. I mean, with the birds, right, you really have to open your eyes and observe carefully. So get ready your binoculars too, because sometimes they're just, you know, amongst the trees that you can't really identify or spot them. The biggest kingfisher that was found in Singapore, if I can share a little bit more, has a size slightly bigger than an A4 paper. It's quite big. Anyway, when they spot their prey, mainly the fishes, right, they will wait for the perfect time before they dive into the water with their wings spread mm. open. Now, the inspiration drawn from these birds was actually their ability to travel between air and water with very minimal splash and noise. Hence, why the bullet train has minimal noise as well. Pretty cool, huh? And this matter of taking ideas and inspiration from designs found in nature it's called biomimicry. Biomimicry is used to design buildings, vehicles, systems, and many more. Some other examples are like your car's shock absorbers, which is inspired by the woodpecker. See, the woodpecker has four structures in its neck to absorb the shock and a spongy bone in its skull to suppress the vibrations. Now, they use this same technology, right, in your car's shock absorbers. That's why your right are less bumpy. Gosh, I didn't know that. Yep, cool, huh? Anyway, something closer to our hearts is like the army camouflage uniform. That is inspired by the octopus and its ability to hide in different places by mimicking 
its surroundings. Oh, 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 I know this. So actually, I actually seen this in the movie called Finding Dory. Yeah. And there was this octopus with awesome ninja skills. And he okay. could just blend into his surroundings everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing all of that, Hika. So I think it's really, really cool that uh we can that we get to know about this thing called biomimicry. And but it's only cool when you actually know about it. And this just changes the way you see nature, isn't it? So I guess in short here, nature inspires and influences us in so many ways. And it pays to coexist in harmony with it in order to protect the natural heritage that we have. So as I said earlier, I love taking pictures when I'm out in the park. So I will try to capture as many f- colors as I can from nature and gather ideas on how to pair these colors together. So sometimes, right, I question things like, why do flowers have beautiful colors? Why are the leaves shaped this way? And you know what? There's always a reason why they are like that. It isn't just random or by chance. So the next time you do go out, look out for these things. This will actually make a very great family activity too. So perhaps you can start by spotting the rainbow colors in nature. Yeah, I think they'll make a great family activity. Thanks, June, for the suggestion. Guys, do share with us your pictures because we are excited to see what you have. Upload it on your IG and hashtag SGHeritageFest. So June, wait, you didn't explain to us Why flowers are colourful? (laughs) Oops! So, flowers need to reproduce and they do so through pollination. So, with bright colours, right, flowers can easily attract birds, bees and butterflies to eat its nectar. When the pollinators are feeding on the nectar, they carry the pollen with them and complete the whole pollination process. That's how flowers bear fruits and then we eat the fruits. (laughs) That's interesting. uh? That's sneaky too, these flowers. uh? And every bit interesting too. (laughs) Um, you know, talking about pollination, right? Do you know that in some parts of the world, people are doing hand pollination? What? Just imagine. <laughs> people are doing the bees' work. So how they are doing it is, because they have grown all these flowers, right? They will identify the male flowers and the female flowers. So it's the male flowers that has the pollen. So what they do is they take the pollen from the male flowers and transfer it over to the female flowers. And that's just for one or a pair of flowers. Imagine thousands and, you know, millions of flowers. And the reason is worrying. We are losing bees around the world, so there isn't enough natural pollination happening. And this is due to intensive farming and even climate change, which results in a loss of habitat for our bees. And that's another reason why we need to bring back our nature. See, when we make decisions, we need to have nature in our best interest. Isn't that right? Exactly. Can you just imagine, right, having having people in the forest to spread the seeds just so that we can grow trees? And that's, that's just not feasible. Wow, now that you paint that, that, that kind of picture, right, it's really hard to imagine for, for us to go through that kind of period. Yeah. Anyway, guys, at this time of recording, we are still staying at home. So do observe the regulations put in place at the time you are listening to the podcast in the event when you want to do any of these activities we have shared. I'm quite positive that we have to diligently adhere to the social distancing rules. I think it will take a while for things to go back to normal. In fact, I also think that we are going to live with a new normal post-COVID. What do you think, Jun? Is it going to affect or change your life significantly if there is going to be, you know, a new normal? So I, I do want to challenge you on this here, Heka. Yeah. So this situation, right, I, I believe that it's not the new normal. Mm-hmm. We have always had a broken relationship with nature. And what COVID-19 has done is to amplify the awareness around this. People are starting to become more and more aware and more and more concerned as it starts to affect our lives directly. Our relationship with nature is not a one-way street. What goes around comes around, you know, just to <laughs> quote a famous song <laughs> here. Oh, I know that song. <laughs> so to ensure that we have oh do you shall we try singing no nope. no way man <laughs> all right just to spare our listeners yep. ears as well <laughs> yeah so going back to the topic what goes around comes around to ensure that we have a safe and bright future for ourselves and our children we need to start relooking at what we have been doing and how to improve our actions so as to reduce the impact on our environment here, I, I would like to take the chance to give M Parks a shout out. They've been working tirelessly on strengthening our foundations, our environmental laws and policies. Last year, they announced the ban on ivory. Yay! Ooh. Which will take effect next year. And
and this actually enhances our efforts against illegal wildlife trade. In addition, this year, they also strengthened the Wildlife Act, which will increase protection, pr preservation and management of wildlife for the purposes of maintaining a healthy right, ecosystem. Right. They've been doing so much great work and we need to continue to support them. Kudos to oh, MPARTS. Well <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting, getting, getting passionate again. <laughs> I'm very happy whenever I see great improvements in all of this stuff. So, you know, that's it, right? I'm sure this is a lot to take in for our listeners. And there's so much to learn about what's happening in the environmental space. For those who are new to this and are keen to learn more, you can go onto our website at www.sg or start following the local green groups like Singapore Climate Rally or the Singapore Youth for Climate Action. They're doing amazing work at communicating key issues to the everyday Singaporean. At the end of the day, I think it's just very important that we start the discussion and we make this issue a national conversation. Every little bit helps, every action counts, and I'm very confident that we can get through this just like how we have done so for the past national challenges, with some determination, collaboration, and action. We have come this far and we will continue. What a way to wrap things up, June. <laughs> Love your energy. <laughs> <laughs> I can always count on your optimism. Um, you know, ultimately, the shape of our future is determined by our decisions today. These decisions will affect the health of our planet and our own future for decades to come. This year, we have a huge opportunity to make things better. What matters is how we act now. Let's make the preservation of our natural heritage a top priority. Had Singapore not initiated some of the present conservation efforts, we would have lost one of the most treasured natural heritage, and that is the Raffles Banded Langer. It's a type of primate species which was discovered by Sir Stamford Raffles himself in the early 1800s. Now, this species is native to only Singapore and Malaysia, and at one point, there were only 40 to 60 of them left in our forest. So the continued protection of the langurs are needed to allow their numbers to slowly grow. However, they are still facing a high risk of extinction due to habitat loss. For example, the upcoming development of the Cross Island MRT line will involve clearing some parts of their already limited habitat. Once again, rapid urbanization emerges as one of the main contributing factors for the loss of our natural world. You see guys, we talk about a lot of things today, so I'm going to help you sum up into three key takeaways. If there is one thing we understand better from this global health pandemic, is nature and our health are closely linked, and that nature is closer to us than we think. So to maintain our good health, we need to address the threats caused by deforestation and pollution. And with that said, we all value the food we eat, right? The clean water we drink, and the clean air we breathe. For us to maintain a good quality of life, we need to preserve natural environment and biodiversity, both in Singapore and around the region. And lastly, I'm sure we are feeling hopeful about our present and what's to come. So to ensure a bright and prosperous future for us, let's do our part to stop climate change. There are two things that you can do right away to achieve this together. You can go to dearsingapore.org to write a letter that shows your support for Singapore to better protect nature. By coming together and stating our concerns, we set the ambition for our businesses, governments, and all of us in what may be the most important decade of our lives. Or you can find a community to learn more and get active by starting conversations. Today, most of these communities can be found online. So connect with them and start talking. Okay, guys, we have come to the end of the podcast. It was a pleasure bringing this special episode to you. Thank you for listening. I hope you have learned a thing or two from us. And of course, a big thanks as well to June for being on the show to share with us more about nature and addressing some important points on the current work WWF and Parks and other local green groups are working towards. Thank you, June. You know what? I think I made a good decision having you here today. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. You're yeah, welcome, of course. It was such a great session, but hold on there. Don't yeah? stop the session yet. You still haven't shared with us what happened to the sacred tree. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. The sacred tree. Okay, right. Thank you for the reminder. I forgot that, man. Um, so, back to that story, that guys. Um, the sacred tree is called the Karamat tree. In English, it translates to the shrine tree. It was believed that people worship the tree. So, when it was removed abruptly by the officers, the contractors 
they claimed to receive like a, a letter from someone anonymous that predicted the death of three senior officers. Not long later, right, three senior officers passed away because the malaria that broke out and thus fulfilling the prophecy. Wow. Okay, I'm sli- slightly regretting asking you for this well. <laughs> explanation. <laughs> Again, guys, this is only a story I gathered from the book, so I cannot attest to the authenticity of these stories. But what we can learn from this story is that we should definitely respect and protect nature. While the belief of spirits residing in trees remains true to only a certain group of people, what is certain is these trees a home to our wildlife. And if you want to know more about Singapore's ancient history, head over to Fort Canning Park and follow the ancient history walking trail. You can also try out other heritage trails like the Passeris Heritage Trail. You know, to know more about other trails, head over to www.nhb.gov.sg. Here at WWF, we also organize nature walks. So if you're ever interested, reach out to us or follow us on our socials. Go over to WWFSG for our IG page or WWF Singapore for our Facebook page. And get yourself updated with the news on our wildlife and, of course, nature. All right, guys, that's the end of it. Come on and join us in a celebration of our heritage. Learn about other programs you and your family or friends can participate in at heritagefestival.sg. Until we meet again, goodbye. Bye.